On July 12, 2008, an eerie silence fell over the peaceful town of Raganan in South Jakarta, Indonesia, following a disturbing discovery. Bags just left on the streets attracted the attention of local residents. The horror of what lay inside led to an immediate call to the police. Inside was dismembered human remains, including a head and a torso. The remains were soon identified as belonging to Henry Santoso, a 40-year-old businessman. But the shocking revelations didn't end there. Within a mere three days, the police had identified a prime suspect, a man named Ryan, and in the backyard of his parents' house, the authorities unearthed the remains of an additional 10 victims. This gruesome discovery cemented Ryan's place as one of Indonesia's most notorious and malevolent serial killers. With Ryan being charismatic, well-presented, and intelligent, while harboring deadly intent, to me, he does have similarities to Ted Bundy. Bundy was known for his charm and good looks, and he used this to gain the trust of his victims, only to reveal a dark side later. Such individuals mask their deviancy with a facade of normalcy, making their crimes all the more chilling. Before we dive in, I want to let you know that I make videos weekly, so if you want to see my next one, please drop the video a like and subscribe if you are new. It really helps me out. Thank you. This video is purely for documentary and educational purposes only. I do not condone the criminals or their actions discussed in this video. On February 1st, 1978, in the city of Yongbang, East Java, Eden Veri Heriancha was born, better known as Ryan. During his early years, he did not get along with his parents or his other siblings. In fact, he harbored plans to kill his mother in his youth. But fortunately, this did not happen. Ryan's mother was a garment trader, and this would often keep her away from the house for days at a time. And his father worked as a security guard at a sugar factory. Growing up, Ryan was exposed to a series of unsettling family dynamics that deeply affected his psyche. It was rumored that his parents would have affairs. This combined with the disturbing circumstances of his older sister being forced into marrying a man who was not only much older than her, but also romantically involved with their mother. This left a deep mark on him. The traumatic moment when he allegedly accidentally witnessed his sister's husband and his own mother's intimacy in the bathroom only intensified his emotional pain. Such impactful experiences during his developmental years took a toll on Ryan's mental health. Ryan's mother, Sayatun, and his father, Ahmed, deny the allegations that they had extramarital affairs. By the age of 10, Ryan's psychological struggles became glaringly evident. He was prone to violent outbursts, often tearing through rooms, breaking anything in sight, and wreaking havoc over minor disagreements or unmet expectations. He could not control his anger, he also did not speak much, especially to his father. In fact, they only spoke when absolutely necessary. Other than his fits of rage, Ryan internalized all of his emotions. 
he never opened up to anyone about it and it grew inside him. By the age of 16, Ryan was at high school. He was intellectually gifted, often outshining his peers. School was a place of solace for Ryan. His principal remembers him fondly for being a good student and well-mannered. However, from a young age, it was clear that Ryan's passion deviated from those of the other male classmates. While most were engrossed in football, motorbike racing or car games, Ryan found joy in activities traditionally linked with females, like dancing and dressing up. This difference in interest led to a sense of isolation as he faced rejection from the male peers at his school. These formative years also saw Ryan grappling with his sexuality, embarking on a journey of self-discovery. Academically, he excelled, finishing high school with outstanding grades and even securing a spot in a prestigious medical faculty. However, his dreams of higher education were dashed due to financial constraints as his parents were unable to support his academic pursuits. He could not continue with his education. In his village, Ryan found solace and purpose by becoming a teacher of Quranic recitation, a path that reflected his deep interest in religion, certainly more so than your average person in Indonesia. During this period, he encountered a young man, then unmarried, religious teacher, from who he sought knowledge and guidance. Their relationship deepened into what Ryan described as a romantic connection, with him considering the man to be, and quote, very special to him. However, this bond was shattered when the teacher ended the relationship to marry a woman. While Ryan says the existence of this romantic bond is real, the teacher has vehemently denied such claims, saying that Ryan was lying and being manipulative. The dissolution of this supposed intense relationship sent Ryan spiraling into emotional turmoil. He said, at the time I was content because I thought I had found someone to depend upon for emotional support. In stark contrast, the teacher paints a picture of volatility, recalling, when he got angry, it was intense. He became so enraged that I had to strike him to defend myself and flee. After their bond had ended, it marked the beginning of a series of threatening messages from Ryan. He hated rejection and did not handle it very well. Ryan would end his interest in teaching religion and from there on, he only spiraled downwards. A year later, in 2007, Ryan would claim his first victim. Ryan also began spending more time with friends of the same orientation. He began to see his old friend, named Guntala Sentio Pramano. According to Ryan, Guntala was the secret lover of another man. Ryan was upset with Guntala for being in this kind of relationship. It angered him that someone should be kept a secret. On a night when Guntala was staying over at Ryan's place, he had fallen asleep as they both watched TV. Suddenly, Guntala awakes and asks Ryan to accompany him to the toilet, which was outside in the dark. Ryan obliges and walks with his friend and waits outside. Now, according to Ryan, Guntala takes a very long time, so long that Ryan falls asleep. But when he woke, he had a murderous desire. He wanted to take his friend's life. With no provocation, Ryan picked up a hoe that was nearby 
and walked into the toilet and repeatedly attacked Guntala, hitting him so many times that he cracked his skull open, which killed him. After realizing what he had just done, Ryan panicked. He lay next to the body, covered in blood, crying. At first, he didn't know what to do, but slowly, he came to his senses. He then picked up Guntala's remains, carried them into a wooded area just behind his house and dug up a grave in an old fishing pond and buried him. After the first kill, they usually panic and take time out before they strike again. But not Ryan. That very afternoon, just a few hours after his first murder, he killed again. The details of why the murder took place are unknown. But what is known is that Ryan and Augustinus Verti Setuan had some kind of disagreement. And again, round at his house, he used a steel rod to beat him to death. And he was buried right next to Guntala, just behind his parents' house. Ryan's compulsion to kill escalated. And by the end of 2007, he had taken the lives of five more individuals, though the specifics of these victims remain undisclosed. What we do know is that all of those who fell prey to Ryan were brought back to his house and beaten to death, similar to his first two victims. They were then buried in what was becoming a graveyard behind his parents' home. None of his victims were ever noticed and Ryan was very careful to cover his tracks. He would later claim he could only remember the friends that he killed, but most of the people were just who he met on the streets. In January 2008, Ryan became acquainted with Greddy Adam, a young man with aspirations to become an actor. They met at a local salon. Charmed by Greddy's handsome appearance, Ryan began to form a friendship with him. They spent time together at the salon, where Ryan would often take photos with Greddy using a friend's phone under the guise of potential modeling work. One evening, the two spent the night at Ryan's parents' house. During that night, Ryan experienced an overwhelming surge of anger that clouded his judgment. In this state, he felt an uncontrollable urge to destroy something, and tragically, he directed his violent impulse towards Greddy. Ryan caved in Greddy's skull using an iron rod, and now what was becoming second nature to him, he buried him in the back with the others. After the murder, Ryan asked his friend at the salon for their phone. He said that he had some modeling work lined up for Greddy and that he needed the photos. Once Ryan gave his friend her phone back, she quickly noticed that all the photos of Greddy had been deleted, all apart from two, which he had mistakenly left as evidence. Shortly after the tragic incident with Greddy Adam, Ryan crossed paths with a 32-year-old woman named Nanik. They struck up a friendship, and one day, Nanik, along with her daughter, Sylvia, they visited Ryan at his home. During their visit, Nanik stumbled upon some nude photographs of Ryan. She said that he was very cute and that she wanted to sleep with him. Ryan came close to her and Nanik said, but isn't it true that you are gay? If so, I could never sleep with you. This, I need to stress, is Ryan's version of events. After this alleged interaction, Ryan went into another rage. He felt belittled, and in a state of anger, he beat Nanik over the head repeatedly with a rock until she died. After watching her mother being beaten to death, Sylvia was screaming in horror, and this is when Ryan, without even thinking, turned round to her 
and did the same. After the previous attack, Ryan would go on to kill two more unidentified men at his house. The graveyard outside his parents' home now had 10 bodies buried within it. Truly horrifying. And even worse, Ryan was not suspected of anything and seemingly nobody was looking for any of the victims. Ryan relocated to Jakarta where he shared an apartment with his partner, Novell. In this new city, Ryan was living in a middle class area and life seemed to be going well for him. Ryan reconnected with an old acquaintance, Harry Santoso. One time, Harry had come to visit the apartment and tensions flared when Ryan discovered Harry's interest in Novell and his proposition of an intimate relationship. Ryan, struggling with intense emotions, got into a heated argument with Harry on July 11th, 2008, which escalated into a violent confrontation. Unable to rein in his anger, Ryan fatally stabbed Harry with a knife. He stabbed him over and over again. He was raging. In a state of panic and confusion over how to conceal the crime, Ryan dismembered Harry's body and packed the remains into a travel bag, a suitcase and a plastic bag. Ryan disposed of these bags, containing Harry's remains at separate locations in the Raogunan area of South Jakarta. Following the disposal of Harry's remains, Ryan took his credit card and went on a spending spree. He indulged in extravagant purchases and even bought a mobile phone for Novell. The following day, on July 12, 2008, the police discovered the dismembered body parts abandoned on the streets of Jakarta. After retrieving the body parts, Law enforcement transported them to the local hospital for forensic examination. The autopsy conducted identified the remains as those of Harry Santoso. Through the investigation into Harry's financial transactions, the police unearthed Ryan's connection to the gruesome event. He was found on CCTV buying items. He had been caught red-handed. On July 15th, 2008, the police apprehended Ryan and his partner Novell at their residence. They were both taken into custody for an extensive interrogation. It was during these sessions that Ryan confessed to the murder of Harry. As the suspect was presented to the media, questions immediately arose. A seasoned journalist took the moment to inquire if this murder was the only one Ryan had committed. Officers said that if there was any more, they would certainly find out. And just four days after his arrest, Ryan would make a confession that would stun the officers. He confessed to the other 10 murders and told them that he had buried them in a makeshift graveyard behind his parents' house. July 20th, 2008, Ryan is brought to his family home in Yonban for the purpose of reconstructing all the murders. Inside the home, they found items belonging to the victims kept in plastic bags, obviously used as mementos. Bone fragments were found in his bedroom, along with a hammer with traces of blood on it. Ryan then took the officers out the back to show them the graveyard. The officers began to recover the remains of the 10 victims. The case explodes quickly and gains huge national attention. The police, suspecting that Ryan might be suffering from mental health issues, sent him for a psychiatric evaluation. Upon assessment, the psychiatrist concluded that Ryan was faking his mental illness, 
simulating the symptoms to appear as if he had a psychological disorder. The experts diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder, highlighting his sociopathic tendencies, his charm and manipulativeness, coupled with an absence of guilt, were characteristics of this condition. He demonstrated a profound inability to emphasize with others, along with a talent for convincingly mimicking emotions that he did not feel. On December 4th, 2008, Ryan arrived at the district court in Deepak, South Jakarta, to be tried for the murder and mutilation of 40-year-old Harry Santoso. Ryan presented himself in traditional Muslim attire and maintained an innocent appearance, which did not align with his true nature. As the trial commenced, his real personality began to surface. He appeared to relish the media attention, enjoying being in front of the television cameras. It seemed as if he was using this newfound notoriety to achieve a level of fame and recognition that had previously eluded him before his crimes came to light. Initially, the media portrayed Ryan as a murderer who killed simply to steal the belongings of his victims. However, this wasn't the case. His motivation to kill stemmed from feelings of being wronged or slighted, which were compounded by an underlying sense of inferiority. The theft of his victim's possessions was only opportunistic, happening post-murder because the items were accessible. Ryan's boyfriend, Novel Andreas, who was arrested in relation to Harry Santosa's murder, admitted to dividing the stolen goods from the crime with Ryan. Novel was released from prison after serving just 10 months for his role in the crime. Meanwhile, Ryan was evasive about Novell's actual involvement in the murder. He appeared torn between being honest about what happened and his desire to safeguard the person he loved. Again though, this could just be a manipulation technique being used. On April 7th, 2009, the district court found Ryan guilty and sentenced him to death for the premeditated murder of Harry Santoso. The court stated that Ryan's actions were cruel and showed disregard for human life. When the verdict was announced, Ryan was seen smiling, seemingly pleased with the attention he was receiving from the media and the people at the trial. After Ryan's sentencing, his legal team filed an appeal based on an insanity defense, hoping to have him committed to a psychiatric institution instead of prison. However, the High Court did not consider the insanity plea relevant and dismissed it. To the public, Ryan may have appeared composed and unflappable, but underneath that serene exterior, lay the workings of a sociopath responsible for some of the most atrocious crimes in Indonesia's history. Ryan openly admits that he is dangerous and if he was given freedom again, he would most likely kill. He has since gained a form of celebrity in Indonesia, or rather infamy, from the pure callousness and brutality of his crimes and behavior. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.